leading us in our worship. I thought that forever change was our, was our motto for our nursery workers. <laughs> Matthew chapter 2, if you want to take a look at that, we're going to look at the first 12 verses this morning. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, talking about the Magi, talking about their gifts that they brought to Jesus. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them, until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for this word that you've given us. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, this event, um, uh, re record of this event of the coming of the Magi and what it teaches us. Lord, um, continue to teach us and guide us so that we can follow you and honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I know that our Christmas decorations are gone, but um, we're still continuing, really, with the story of Christmas um, with the coming of the Magi. So after Jesus was born, the Magi traveled so that they could find him. And uh, this would have taken some time for them uh, to find where Jesus was born. Um, from this account in Matthew, um, the Protestant church kind of estimates that it, it could have taken up to two years uh, for them to see the star and then to make the plans and to make the trip and to eventually get to um, Bethlehem. One of the reasons they think that is because of when Herod responded after the Magi left of wanting to kill all the baby boys, he, he wanted to kill all the baby boys who were two years and younger. So many of the scholars believe that it could have taken um, quite a while for the Magi um, to actually get to find Jesus. So seeing the Magi, the wise men in our stable, manger scenes, um, that's really not very biblical. They would have come later. But there are other church traditions, cultural traditions, um, that say that the Magi took 12 days. Um, you've heard of the 12 days of Christmas. Um, you've heard of the Epiphany, the El Dia de los Reyes, the Day of the Kings, um, which is, by the way, next Sunday, January 6th. That's the 12th day. That's the Day of the Kings. Um, that, again, in different cultures, different religious traditions, that's the celebration of the coming of the wise men, the coming of the, of the kings, the coming of the magi um, to find Jesus. But we really, you know, as we think about it, it might be that in your life that you know very little about the magi, or you just haven't heard much about them, except, you know, around Christmas you've heard a few stories. Or maybe um, as, you were, as you were growing up, you heard all sorts of stories about the wise men, the three kings, and, and maybe even heard their names, maybe heard where they're from, the purpose for their trip, who, you know, who they were and all the background. You may have heard all that, but that comes from some different traditions. What I just read today is all that the Bible says about the Magi. It doesn't give any other details about them. So obviously, if you've heard other stories, these are other traditions through the church um, that you may have heard. Many of the Bible students, I mean, they have different ideas about these magi. Um, some believe that they were very religious men from the East um, that had great authority. Some believe that they were actually descendants of the religious counselors of the Medo-Persian Empire, um, and then maybe even before that, the Babylonian Empire. If they were, and 
pro probably were. Uh, they would have, their relatives would have had um, been influenced by Daniel, and that influence would have been carried down to them. Um, that's probably why they knew something about the king of the Jews um, and knew that they should go to Jerusalem um, as, a, as a result of seeing that star. But whoever they were, they made this trip to see Jesus. And again, when we think about the Magi, you know, we think about them as part of the Christmas story and the gifts that they brought. And, um, you know, we think about that when we think of the Magi, the wise men, the three kings. Um, but really, as I said, we don't know a lot about them. But it's not just to know a story about some men who traveled to, to come to Jerusalem to eventually make it to Bethlehem. God has given us this um, passage of Scripture to teach us. He's to teach us some lesson, to make application in our life from this, not just to record some events. And today I want to share some of these lessons with you that I see um, in this passage of Scripture to what we can learn um, from the wise men. So as we take a look at um, these wise men, the first thing that we can learn is that they were more than curious. We have to understand, they were more than curious. If they were just a little curious, they would have seen that star and they would have had somebody else go on that trip and find out what was going on and come back and talk to them about that. But they didn't do that. They went on that trip. Um, and as we think about it, that wasn't an easy trip. I mean, they, uh, if, in fact, it would have been the same route probably that Abraham had taken when he, land, he went from the land of Ur and then ended up in the land of Canaan. That would have been the route that the Magi would have traveled um, to, to find the one who's born king of the Jews. If they were just a bit curious, they may have made it down to Jerusalem, but then once they got to Jerusalem, they may have just said, okay, we saw this star, there's something happening, we want to let you guys know about it, um, we're heading back home. Uh, but they didn't do that. They, they wanted to get some more information. They, they, were, they were searching to, to find the one who was born king of the Jews. They were more than just a little bit curious. They were committed. They were committed to traveling that great distance. They were committed to finding the truth. They were committed to finding the actual place where the king of the Jews was. They were committed to do all that searching. And in the first verse of Matthew chapter 2, we read that after Jesus was born, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. So once they get to Jerusalem, they get the information to make it to Bethlehem. And once they get to Bethlehem, they're able to see something from the star to make it to this house, and they worshiped Jesus. Not in a mansion, not in a palace, just a little house is where they found Jesus and worshiped him. These men were more than curious. Uh, there, sh there should have been other people in the east that would have seen that star, but they didn't make that trip. Maybe they were a little bit curious. But the Magi, they were committed, and they wanted to get to this place and worship the king of the Jews. So we've been talking about gifts. Over these last couple of weeks, we've been talking about gifts. Last week, we talked about the gift that God has given to us through Jesus Christ, our salvation. Um, and today, as we think about the Magi, obviously, we think about their gifts that they gave to Jesus when they, when they found him. I want to talk something else about some gifts that God has given us and, and remind you about... Um, about these gifts that we have in our lives. We call them spiritual gifts. And you may not know much about spiritual gifts. Maybe you've studied a lot about spiritual gifts. We're going to have that class in January, starting on the 13th. It's a Sunday night class where we're going to talk about the spiritual gifts. But one, one thing as we look at this idea about spiritual gifts, I mean, even when you think about our gift of salvation or spiritual gifts, any type of gift that God has given us, are you just a little curious about it, or are you committed to finding out uh, the truth about these gifts that God has given to us? God tells us some exciting things about the spiritual gifts that he offers to us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 7, it says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. God works through these gifts in all of us. He gives us each, as the Bible says, a manifestation of His Spirit when we're in Christ. Are you curious about that? 
Or do you really want to know what that manifestation of the Spirit is in you? What gifts God has given you to be able to use in His kingdom? We need to be able to move beyond this level of curiosity into a commitment to say, I want to know what this gift is. I want to be able to serve the Lord in the best way possible um, in a way that's going to honor Him and be the most effective for His kingdom. We do that as we live um, and we serve using the gifts that God has given to us. So just like these men who were more than curious were willing to make that trip, we need to be more than curious and be willing to learn about our spiritual gifts that God has given to us. What else do we learn from these wise men? Well, we find out that they gained knowledge. We need to understand that as well in our lives, that they gained knowledge. That's an example for us. They, made the, they saw the star. They made the trip to Jerusalem. They must have known they needed to go there. They made the trip to Jerusalem, and they stopped and they asked, where is the king of the Jews going to be born? Now, it's biblical. Men can't stop and ask for directions. They actually did it. So men, if you ever struggle with that, it's in the Bible. We're allowed to do that. They listened to the information, and then they went to Bethlehem. Now, the part with the star is a little bit hard to figure. Because when you, we always tell the story of they followed the star. Little drummer boy, you know, they were watching the wise men um, travel at night so that they could follow the star. But really, the Bible just says they saw the star, they went to Jerusalem, they got the information about Bethlehem, and then they saw the star again as they made their way um, to Bethlehem. And that star actually showed them the house where Jesus was, where he lived. Uh, and so it's kind of a, Interesting thing, people have tried to figure out what this star is. I believe there's something God put in the sky that actually shone right on this home so that they could get to the exact spot where Jesus was. So they're making this trip. They, need, they know enough information to get to Jerusalem because they, something they've been taught that this is the king of the Jews that's born. That's what the star was showing them. And then they got the knowledge. They, they heard the passage of Scripture from the Old Testament that prophesied that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And so then they left there, and they went to Bethlehem, and then the star helped them to find that house. As we think about our life, you know, uh, we recognize that as we try to follow God, as we seek the Lord in our lives, we need some knowledge. We need, we need his knowledge in our life so that we can honor him, we can live for him, and we can do what God wants us to to do in our lives. And since I'm talking about spiritual gifts, I want to let you know that there's a, a few places in the New Testament that give these lists of these spiritual gifts. I want to just give you a couple of them this morning. Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So not only are some of the gifts listed, but the attitude on using those gifts is given as well by Paul in Romans chapter 12. But Paul gives a different list in uh, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. And so we have this list as well. And so when we have this class in January, we're going to go through these lists that are found in Scripture and talk about these spiritual gifts and what they are, what it means, and how we're able to use them within, for ministry within the body of Christ. So what do we learn from the wise men? Well, we learn that they were more than curious, and we learn that they gained some knowledge. But there's one more thing we learned from them. They gave their gifts, Right? They showed up. It had been a little bit strange for them to finally show up to the house and get there and say, no, I don't think I really want to give this gift away. No, they, that was the whole purpose, right? To get there, to find the king of the Jews, to give him the gifts, and then to, and to worship him. And that's what they did. Matthew tells us, after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They fell to the ground and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh.
Can you imagine how they felt when they finally found Jesus? They had been searching all this time, and they finally found him. They were overjoyed, and they worshipped him. They gave him those gifts. Again, this, the, the three gifts is probably why we have three kings or three wise men. There could have been more gifts and more, uh, probably more men that were there um, to, to do all this presenting. But we've looked at these gifts and kind of looked at some symbolism of these gifts. Gold is a gift for a king. Uh, frankincense is incense. And uh, they use their frankincense or incense in their worship time. And so incense or frankincense, that would be a gift for, for a deity, for God, because they used it to worship God. And then myrrh is, uh, were some spices that they used in burial when they wrapped up the, the body and wrapped them in cloths and, and uh, they put the spices on the, on the cloths and they lay that person in the tomb. Uh, myrrh was one of those spices, uh, fragrance, fragrances that they used. Again, it would have been valuable um, at, just for itself, but the symbolism of it was that you used that for somebody who was dying or was going to die and we know that Jesus, as our Savior, he died for us. So we see some symbolism in these gifts. I'm not sure if that's what God was trying to do when he had these men bring these gifts to Jesus, but we can see some of that today. But they came and they were prepared to worship Jesus. They, they, they had their gifts, they were prepared, they came and they presented them, and then they worshiped him. Paul tells us to offer our bodies as living sacrifices to God. He says, this is our daily worship. They worship by giving their gifts. Paul says, as we present our body as a living sacrifice, this is our daily worship. What does that mean, our daily worship, presenting our bodies to God? Well, we're going to talk about that in that class on spiritual gifts. So as a Christian, you have spiritual gifts, and God has given them to you, and he wants you to be able to, just like these magi, these wise men, to be able to offer these gifts to God and to others, we are able to use our gifts in ministry and helping others, um, which brings glory and honor to God. We do that. That's part of our worship of our life of worshiping God. When people attend church, and actually for you that just continue to come to church, uh, and, and when we come together in a body, uh, you know, a church body, uh, there's basically four things that, that we need in our lives. Um, as, we, as we seek um, God and, and we're together in the church. One of them is the need for spirituality. We have that innate desire within us to worship. God has put that in us, and we need some direction. We need that, the truth of the one true God to, to worship and, and how to worship him and, and to be led in worship and be taught about worship and to be taught about God and, and what it means to follow him. And so we have that need of spirituality where we can be directed to, to be able to worship the Lord. And a church full of people using their gifts will be able to meet that need. And we also have the need for community. Um, people long to, to be close to God, but we also have this desire to, to get close to others as well in a community as we follow the same God. Uh, we find that when you don't experience community in the church, people go to a different church. When they don't build up that community around them and that community is not built around them, then all of a sudden they're not going to be so committed and maybe start looking elsewhere. So community is a, is a great need. And a church full of people using their spiritual gifts will meet that need. And we also have a need for care. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's going to be during a crisis. Uh, maybe it's going to be just a time of some encouragement that you need. Uh, maybe it's just the, the understanding that the people around you actually care about you. They pay attention to you, care about you, and encourage you, and are there for you um, in that time, when, in that moment when you need somebody. A church full of people using their spiritual gifts will meet this need. And they also have a need for the opportunity to serve others, to do things for others, to help others. We've been created this way. Alicia mentioned earlier about how we've been created to give. Uh, we've been created to serve as well. Now, we don't always recognize that. That might have to be developed in our, in our lives, but that's how God created us, to be able to reach out and serve and help others. You see, when you are loved, you have that desire to return that love and to show that love and show that love for others. When people have their needs of spirituality and 
community and care met, the overflow of gratitude of all that is this desire to serve, this desire to help, this desire to minister, to be there for somebody else. And that abundance will flow out of your life into meeting needs for people around you. A church full of people using their spiritual gifts will meet this need as well. That's what I want to see happen here at FCC, that we use our gifts so that we can meet each other's needs. This is the way that God has designed it. He's designed us to do that. And so remember, these gifts that we're talking about, and Paul had to remind the church of Corinth about this because they had the wrong view of the gifts. These gifts that God has given us, these spiritual gifts, they are for the good of the church, the good of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 again, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. God wants us to use our spiritual gifts for each other, to build up one another, and then God will be honored in the process. But we need to be more than just a little bit curious about our spiritual gifts. And we might need some of that knowledge to be able to understand what these gifts are and how we can use them in the best way possible, be the most effective in our lives of, of serving the Lord and his kingdom. And then we just need to lay them out there and use those gifts, use them in our lives to, to serve the Lord and to serve one another so that the body of Christ will receive the, will receive the benefit you may remember that, uh, that movie, uh, Bruce Almighty, with Jim Carrey. Don't build your theology from that movie. But it's interesting. There's a couple lines in that movie that I thought were very clever. Um, in one scene, towards the end, God's speaking with Bruce, and he says to Bruce, people want me to do everything for them. They don't realize that they have the power. And I thought, wow, you know, as I thought about that statement... That's, a, that's an amazing truth, but it happens in the church. You see, we come to church, and we, and we say, okay, I'm supposed to come to church, so I come to church, and I'm supposed to read the Bible, so I read the Bible, and I'm supposed to pray, and so I pray. I'm supposed to give an offering, so I give an offering, and now I've done all I'm supposed to do, and I'm going to sit back and let God do all the rest. That's kind of how we think sometimes, but that's not, that's not biblical, and that's not what the way that God has created the church and and that's not his purpose for us. See, he's given each of us power. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. And through that Holy Spirit, God has given us gifts. Gifts that we can use in the body of Christ so that the body of Christ will be built up. We would encourage others. We will be encouraged. We'll help others. We will be helped. And through all of this, God is honored. And that's what, we've, that's what we need to do in the body of Christ. That's why we're having that class if you haven't signed up for it yet, I, I encourage you to because we want to, be, we want to be able to serve the Lord in the most effective way possible using the power that he's given us so that we can do his work and his will. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, this time, this opportunity to open your word. I pray, Lord, that we would be encouraged by your word. We would be challenged by it, Father, to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. As we have our invitation song, if there's a decision you need to make for Christ, we want to give you that opportunity. If you have a prayer request, we'll be glad to pray with you. Let's go ahead and stand together as we sing.